All right. Hey there, and welcome back to another episode of A Cup of Joe. My name is Joe Escobedo, and with me on the show is Emily Mary Vane. Thanks so much for being on the show, Emily. Thank you so much for having me. So Emily is the Global Marketing Director at Tunes. So Emily, want to find out a bit more about you. How would you actually describe what you do to, say, a five-year-old? Um, so right now, what I feel I'm doing as a global marketing director is representing two things in the company, representing our partners and customers, so ensuring their um, requirements uh, and their needs are met with our products and also representing our company outside for the world. Got it. That makes perfect sense. And I can tell from your, your background, you've kind of been all over the place. You've been in North America, South America, Asia Pacific. But what has really been the biggest difference you've seen in terms of communications and digital marketing strategies in each of those places? So I think in terms of uh, marketing strategy, uh, at the end of the day, you always have the same um, uh, process, thought process. You have the end goal, and then you're going to use different tactics, channels, and formats. But I've seen a lot of different changes in, in the use of those channels and formats towards what you want to achieve, right? They're not going to play the same roles, and they're not going to target the same objectives. So you would not use LinkedIn the same way you use it in the U.S., versus China, this is very obvious, um, but same with uh, email marketing, for example. Um, so I feel at the end of the day, having a, a global strategy that can encompass what you want to achieve and then drilling down towards your goals regionally or locally, um, depending on the size of your company, is best. Um, and it will mean adapting to certain channels that are not you know, the same in some of the countries and some of the tactics that might not be the same as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I want to hear more about the global strategy, but first, uh, I think you bring up a good point. Let's, let's talk about one channel, LinkedIn. What are the differences you see companies in, say, North America versus Asia Pacific in the way they use that platform? Um, so I think, well, during the pandemic, obviously, you've seen like a big uptick of LinkedIn uh, and the interaction and engagement of everyone across the globe using LinkedIn because they want to have conversation, they want to be a part of the conversation. Um, uh, and many companies are using LinkedIn now as well to uh, position themselves are as online, present, and reachable as well. Um, but what I've seen differently is the use of our uh, colleague at sales uh, in the sales department, their way of using uh, LinkedIn is, is much, much, much more different. So the, um, the concept of networking is also slightly different in the US than it is, for example, in, in Singapore or in, in China, for that matter, or even Japan. Um, so the way you connect as well might be different. Um, I cannot tell you how many requests I've received re recently on LinkedIn uh, for a pre presentation of services and, 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 and solutions without having uh, not even a hello, hi, how are you, uh, <laughs> just to the point, which I sometimes appreciate, but also sometimes I want this, you know, human connection, especially during a time where I, I am at home, isolated as well, right? Yeah. What about you? Yeah. No, you I... I I, I mean, I'm, I'm American, but I've been in uh, Asia Pacific for 13 years now, China as well as Singapore. So yeah, I've kind of had my foot in both of those areas. And I would say, yes, I think one thing I do see across the board is, like you said, those sales pitches, those unsolicited sales pitches. And I think I get a few, I get a lot more than I do. And I think that's one thing that I try to do with uh, kind of the consulting and training I do is help sales people really get away from that and go about what you said, building relationships instead, because I don't know how many executives I've spoken with and they said, I get just flooded with these messages and nine times out of 10, you're not even gonna read it. If you can tell it's like a, you know, a spam or a cold kind of message. And if anything, what I've seen is some executives actually taking uh, screenshots of that and publishing it on LinkedIn. It's kind of like a big no-no, like here's what not to do. So there's a lot of things that could go wrong with doing that. So yes, I absolutely agree uh, the importance of kind of building relationships. 
especially from a sales point of view. You need someone you can trust and, and work with on a regular basis. And those kind of messages never work. I don't know if people still do it. <laughs> now, you talked about global strategy, and I want to get your thoughts on this because you're, you know, developing it. Um, how did you actually get started? What was the things that you took into consideration in building it? Um, so it, it really, it, for me, it really starts with the end goal in mind. Mm. Where, where do I want to be in a year, two, or three? Um, what is it that I want to be seen as, positioned as, or, you know, do I want to be the expert in a certain area? Do I want to be seen as, as disruptive? Uh, what are my um, sales target as well, right? So how do I uh, weave that into my strategy? So I think there's a, I, I take it as three steps is what is my end goal? What is, what's in it for all the stakeholders where, whereas we're talking internally or externally. So who do I need to involve? um in that strategy and then um what do i what resources do i need so um for example um i, I would say it's a what who how basically right mm. what do i achieve who do i want to talk to and and it can be internal and externally as well and how i'm going to achieve that so the resources i need um, it can be uh, financial resources but it can also be simply uh, people right um, who who do I need uh, the support from to realize that strategy? And then and then I'll go into okay, what are my channels and you know what are the formats I want to reach? What are the which stages of the cell cycle am I talking to and what am I doing right? But I think the over overall frame is also the the, the basic of you know who what how yeah and yeah. No, I, I love that model. I think it's very easy to understand. I love that you've thought about the people approach. I think a lot of people don't really think about internal stakeholders, which depending on the size of an organization is imperative. You want to get things off the ground. Um, so yes. I love that you, you asked that question, what's in it for them? So what's in it for marketing? What's in it for sales? What's in it for ops and so on? Um, on top of the, the who, what, um, how, does why become a, a factor in as well? The reason I ask that is because a lot of organizations tend to do things without understanding either their own mission or um, how it's going to benefit the, the company or does that, does that why, or even trying to get internal kind of investment or buy-in, do you get like a lot of um, pushback or how do you get around kind of answering that why question? Why do you do things? Yeah. So I think the, the, I, what I've, what I've seen working most of the time is to be data driven and if mm -hmm. possible, shifting as well the needle in terms of revenue uh, target, right? We've seen marketing uh, department getting more and more into having a revenue target as well. Um, so I think as soon as you show that, why are you doing this? Because at the end of you know this year or two or three, this is the kind of revenue I'm expecting, right? This is the kind of conversion I'm expecting. This is the kind of leads or amount of leads I'm expecting. Um, and, now, I, I am, um, in that sense, I'm really data-driven because I feel that's the only thing that makes people, at the end of the day, you know, sign a check. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and I feel it's important for us as well, uh, you know, in, in marketing. For, for the longest time, people have said, like, what we do is not um, measurable or we cannot be, you know, uh, held accountable for what we do because there's a lot of creativity and then, and then there's a lot of uh, um, uh, kind of uh, um, bluff or blah blah around what we do but I think yeah. it, it, as I said with digital marketing I think we, we have all the tools we need to actually measure and also what is great is we can not only measure but the good thing is that if something is not working it's really easy to iterate and change it, right? It's really easy to understand, okay, do I need to change it or do I need to stop completely, let go of this and go for something else? I think right now we have we have all the tool we need, whether or not we're using it well, that's a complete yeah. different story. And if yeah. we are able to optimize them all, I'm not sure, but at least we have those tools to be able to say, hey, look, this is what I'm bringing to the table. This is the do dollar value I'm bringing to the table. So yes, for each dollar we're going to spend, this is what we're going to get. 
And I feel we have that now and we should be using it more and more. No, I think it's, it's a very good point. I would love to get your thoughts on because you've mentioned kind of mapping out or predicting what is the impact in terms of revenue, in terms of leads, in terms of conversions. What's the process like um, to make those um, predictions? Um, so what, I, uh, what I've been doing um, in terms of, of prediction and forecast is I've been, um, you know, looking at the channel, the sales channel and saying, okay, if, if we want to have, say, X amount of calls or X amount of meetings or X amount of, I work backward of, okay, how many, like, email marketing, how many advertising do I need? How many, you know, campaigns and spend do I need to be able to reach that amount of marketing qualified leads? And then that amount of square uh, sales uh, qualified leads and then how much it converts. So I've done the math of, at least in our company, what I've been doing is I've looked backward without having marketing, how long can be the sales cycle and uh, how much can we reach without having um, a real spend and, and now how we're moving the needle with, uh, with marketing spend. So what is changing? Are we decreasing the sales cycle? Are we... Um, having a better um, way to capture um, people's attention and then uh, nurturing them until they become a marketing, marketing qualified lead. So I do use a, a formula of percentage to, you know, drill that down towards, okay, if I, if I spend that amount, we should get, you know, those exact sales qualified leads that will convert in that amount of time and average, you know, um, sales or revenue would be that amount. So um, I've done that uh, and I'm uh, looking forward to see if that is now accurate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, like I said, I, I love the approach. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you in the hot seat a bit because I think, um, I, I wanna get your thoughts on how you do that from like a top of the funnel in terms of like, you know, building a brand or like even the education that you do internally with the team or the partners. How do you put a number to that? Because I think that's always a challenge within organizations. It's very easy to do conversions. You can increase conversions yes. by ten percent and so yes. on. That's like that's like easy peasy. But I think where a lot of organizations struggle is that really that top end that that, that brand, which is extremely important, that a lot of B two B organizations under, underestimate. But going back to your point, how do you go about quantifying the impact of that if you're going to invest in it? Yeah. So it. For us, for example, or in my in my case, what I've been doing is some of the market do need more um, because of the market maturity. They would need more educational pieces than other. Um, so this then changes in terms of how do I approach it, um, in the sense of okay, this this region needs a particular um, um, uh, amount of dollars spent towards uh, more uh, awareness more informational content or educational content. Um, and then what we have noticed is, for example, if you start uh, spending there, you will see a few things you, you start noticing directly and, and that are measurable is obviously, uh, so you're rich, so you see, for example, your followers on LinkedIn growing, you see your visitors on the website uh, growing, you see your inquiry uh, from those markets uh, growing. Um, and then it goes into the nurturing part. But I do feel this is what we, we've been noticing, is the moment we start doing a, one single thing um, in one market, then you see that number is growing. So um, it, it can take as, it can be as small as just a press release, for example, for a single market, and you see the result directly. And that's what we've seen um, in our industry because it's a small industry because we're B2B players. So it's not like if anyone could come and visit our website, it, you, you need to be interested. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, I think that makes perfect sense. I love that you have kind of mapped out those where the awareness of the penetration is relatively low and help with the educational pieces. I think the biggest mistake I see a lot of B2B companies go is they go straight to that bottom of the funnel. They can start pushing the promotional things without the market, like you said, really understanding, you know, what is it the solution that you're offering? Um, you know, how can you guys add value to the conversation? So I love that you guys take that kind of education approach for, you know, um, markets with lower awareness or a reach. 
Yeah, and I think it's, it's also because, you know, at the end of the day, we, we do have the same message or the same overall, the key value proposition will not change. But what, what we are uh, as a company, any company globally, what you are doing, what you are offering, the result um, and the efficiency gains or whatever it is that your customer have usually are the same, right? Now, how you approach that, like, do you want to be seen as, as pioneer and disruptive and innovative because, you know, the, 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 the industry as a whole in that region is not there yet. So you are there to bring your point and see, you know, what is happening in the industry and show, sorry, what's happening in the industry and what's new and what can be done. Uh, or is it that you are already um, talking to a very mature market that knows what's doing. So you want to be seen as the go-to you know, service provider or partner, like trusted, reliable. Um, so I think it, it, it is very difficult to do it on a global level and it is very difficult to uh, understand all the nuances in the different markets. But if you have, if you have your overarching message, the, 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 the truth of your company, right, of what you're selling, then, then you can then you know, have a, a different approach for different markets. I think that makes perfect sense. And you bring up a very good point around positioning, or at least kind of the positioning you want to portray, going back to the end goal, um, identifying that first and then working backwards. In terms of that positioning, how much of it comes from internally versus external factors? Now, to give you an example, you talked about, you know, let's say that we want to be seen as the most innovative company in our space. But then you ask any of our customers, our partners, and they perceive you, perceive you as a dinosaur. Um, yeah. So, so how, how do you kind of strike the balance between what the internal team envisions versus the reality, their sentiment in the market? Yeah, and that's a very good question. Um, I think I think it depends on. Uh, I would say our positioning or the positioning of the company cannot be completely off with what the market is thinking. Now you can obviously, you know. Uh, change that um, positioning or that perception. And then you've seen brand doing it for the longest time, like beauty brands that I remember my mom or grandmother using and suddenly they're becoming trendy again. So you have that renew, renewed interest and, and kind of repositioning. Um, but it, it does take uh, a lot of uh, effort. And the thing is that in B2B, if you're seen as a dinosaur, it is hard. It is hard because you, you, you probably, if, if people are, are looking at you and, you, and, and, and thinking that you have a, you know, a legacy and, and a big past and a big history, that can be very valuable, um, but that can also be, become um, um, a, a, yeah, a, a barrier towards what you want to achieve. Now, if you are able to show that you know, even dinosaurs, you know, are able to evolve, and uh, you are doing um, new things, and you are actually uh, launching new products and in innovative ways to do things. Then I, I think people will will change. And and what I've noticed is that for B two B, and I'm not talking B two C because I'm not I'm I'm not so familiar. But for B two B, it's also um, a, a lot. A lot of it goes with who do you partner with, who do you work with, right? So, you know, if you have the, when you talk about big companies, like for example, the um, the likes of MasterCards and Visa, they're the big, big companies and they have a past, but they're very innovative. They always have, you know, their research and development. They always try and new and launch new products. And if you partner with them, it does not make you, you know, a dinosaur. It makes, you know, it makes a name for you. So um, I do believe it, it is, it, it has its perks to be seen as sometimes as a, a historical company. Yeah, no, it's a very good point. And the reason I ask is because one of my clients is kind of one of those challenger brands. It's a new upcoming brand. And where they're facing a lot of uphill battle is a lot of their, uh, the incumbent has been around for, you know, 50, 60, 70 years. So they're the new kids in the block, but then the older 
companies are saying, look, we've been doing this for so many years, you know, why should you trust this new company? So I guess yeah. it really goes back to the, the um, appetite for risk within a particular industry as well. So they're in the finance industry. And so obviously that tends to be slightly more conservative in a lot of ways. Um, but for example, let's say you're doing B2B travel or something that the risk is relatively lower Then I imagine that having that, you know, a challenger, that innovative spirit would be something you want to highlight versus the other ones who haven't really changed over the years. Yeah, and it's also about, um, so it, it really, as you said, like they want to work with a, a slightly older company. Um, I mean, what they're bringing is probably what something, it's a, a cost, um, cost effort kind of uh, uh, um, a dilemma. Do I want to do it internally or can I just, you know, work with this partner, plug it in, and see and see how it goes. Obviously, there's a uh, there's also also yeah cost risk, but um, you've seen a lot of um, companies going through digital transformation, and instead of trying to do it all themselves, because at some point we have to be honest, right? We cannot do it all. Then you bring in third parties that can do it and do it you know faster um, than you could. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. I mean, it's it's good to hear that from my perspective as well because I'm on the the opposite side when I kind of help a lot of brands. So um, yeah, I, one thing that I try to do is give them the skills so they can run it in house themselves. Um, because I've been working across different industries and different sectors, I have a much broader view. I think it's one of the challenges when you're in an organization, particularly for a while is you get a very um, narrow view of the market, the industry, and you hear the same things over and over. Um, so that's good to hear that, you know, there is an opportunity to kind of, uh, provide a new perspective. It just goes back to that, like you said, that cost benefit analysis and say, is the perceived cost, whether it's time or investment, worth it to, like you said, either accelerate something or learn different ways to approach a situation. So good, good tips for me as well. <laughs> now, earlier you talked a little bit about kind of partnerships and I know this is crucial in um, B2B, particularly in a lot of tech companies, the, the idea of channel partnerships. Uh, whether it's resellers or people that help um, expand the reach or the sales for a particular um, company. What are, what are your thoughts on, on that internally? You, you mentioned it, but I want to get your thoughts on how you guys may build that program. How are you guys maintaining it? Um, so we, um, we work with a lot of uh, partners. We, we call them partners, but it, it would be more of members or customers if you want. So um, we do go direct uh, usually. Um, but I think in any kind of partnership, there are three things you really need to um, take into consideration. It's for me, at least, it's transparency, um, clear uh, goal and, and vision and customer centricity. So when I say transfer transparency is to understand that um, we are in it to win it, but together. <laughs> so the more you grow, the more I grow. And we, we clear on this and we know our areas of growth together. Um, we, we are clear on our goals and we know they're realistic. So what do you want to achieve and how we're going to do it together? Um, and, and what are the pain points that we can solve um, and how long it will take to solve them? Um, to, to be very realistic with that. And then uh, on the third one, the customer centricity is I feel like with a partner, they need to focus on their core business and we need to focus on our core business because the more they are doing and they're taking care of their core business, the better it is for us. And we can focus on our core business because that's the best for them as well. So we come in with their pain point and their main, um, the main solution we can offer so they can relax and take care of their uh, core business. And, and then we don't have to do what they're doing for us as well. Um, so yeah. Mm. That a couple key things I really like from what you said. I think the first is transparency and setting expectations, whether it's in terms of timelines, in terms of the process post-purchase. I think it's a, a key thing. And to be honest, I don't think a lot of B2B companies do that very well. Um, I think they get very excited when they win the, win the deal and then post that. It's like, <laughs> we'll figure it out. So I love that you're kind of being transparent and setting expectations early on. Um, and the second point was around kind of, we will help you do the things um, so you can do your job better. You said it in a more eloquent way, but I, but I love that I love that concept because you know 
at the end of the day, an organization, a person can't do everything. There are things that are better outsourced, like you were saying, um, so they can focus on their core company. So I love that kind of analogy of thinking about it from their perspective and saying, look, we can take this off your plate, essentially. Um, here's essentially yeah. what that'll cost and here's the timeline, et cetera. But don't even worry about that. We'll completely take care of that. So you focus on what you do best. Um, I'm actually going to steal that, by the way. I think it's a really good motto. <laughs> I think it's a, I think it's a brilliant way of, you know, uh, you know, solidifying some of those partnerships and saying, look, you have certain things that you want to focus on and there's certain things that are probably best uh, either through technology or through a partner that you can better leverage, um, get more of your time. So really, really good insights for me as well. I'm sure a lot of folks listening to this are getting some really um, good ones too. Um, I think, like I said, I want to get you get to know you a little bit on the personal level because you're doing something very fascinating and I want to find out more about it. You took place, you're taking place in the Mongol Derby. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, that's Tell me correct. what that is. <laughs> so um, it's a horse race in uh, Mongolia that should have happened this year in August. Um, but now it will happen next year um, in July. And it's a thousand, uh, thousand kilometer horse race in 10 days or less. Um, wow. It is a crazy adventure. Um, and I, I, I actually decided to, um, to sign up uh, after a, a car crash. Um, that I had here uh, around Asia and that I realized that, you know, we all have our dreams and things that we put on the side because they are, you know, not on the top of our to-do list. Um, but that's when I realized, okay, my time is now. Like whatever you want to do, put it on your, you know, to-do list and not, you know, not, not, don't close the box and put it on the side. Open the box and start doing things. Um, and I think it led me to meet a lot of different people uh, to have very um, uh, insightful interaction with not only um, the horse community, but also in Singapore with many different uh, people going on, on crazy adventures as well. Um, and, and, uh, and me being here. <laughs> yeah. No, I, absolutely. I, I love that point of view. And I think that is... I, I did had plenty of crazy adventures, and I'm happy to talk about that offline. Now I have two kids, and the adventures have kind of <laughs> died out a bit. But uh, you're absolutely right, like you said, um, you know, taking the risk, and you know, life is too short, as we've realized in the current you know, pandemic. So I, I'd love to hear how that goes. I think you know, if there's any photos or videos, happy to share that as well. But I think it sounds like an amazing experience. Um, Emily, thank you so much for your time today. I really, really appreciate it. Last question is, how can people get in touch with you? Um, so I am available on LinkedIn. You can find my profile under Emily Mervain. Um, I guess you'll have also the link to my profile. Uh, yes. Otherwise, yeah. And otherwise, if you're interested into the Mongol Derby, you can find uh, my website at mymongolderby.com. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. I really, really appreciate you sharing your insights. Like I said, I got a lot of key takeaways. I'm sure the people watching will as, as well. Um, if you are watching this and you enjoyed today's interview, please feel free to share it uh, with any colleagues or anyone who might find it helpful. Otherwise, we'll see you again soon. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. And we'll see you again very soon. Thanks. <laughs>